Welcome everybody to another episode of What's Working in E-Commerce. I'm your host, Egan Heath from Caravan Digital. We're a digital marketing agency for direct and consumer e-commerce brands. And we specialize in paid social, paid search, and email automation. Today I'm speaking with Will Perry, who is an expert in paid media and paid social media and all kinds of ad scaling. He and his teams have spent a lot of money online and made his clients a lot of money. Will, welcome. Tell us a little bit about what you have going on, kind of your different companies. Yeah, great to be here with you. Um, always excited to nerd out on some ads and marketing and offers and things like that and um, you know, chat with fellow experts in the e-com space. Um, yeah, but just... I'm kind of embedded in all things ads all the time. Um, you know, we've got our uh, manage, uh, ad management agency, Reason. Um, we've got a creative agency, Future Content, that specializes in UGC creative for uh, brands running TikTok. And then we also have our Elite Media Buyers Academy, um, where we train marketers and ad buyers on our secret ninja ways in order to you know, optimize um, their cost per acquisition and scale to 20K a day or more through paid social. Um, so yeah, happy to be here with you. Yeah, that's amazing. We're excited to learn from all your experience. I'm curious on the, the creative side and the creative agency, you know, is that something where iOS has kind of forced our hand or has creative always been important and now it's just more important? Yeah, I love this topic, actually. Um, just a short answer. Um, yes, creative has, or I'm sorry, iOS has made the creative significantly more important. The marketers and brands who have always put an emphasis and a focus on their messaging, speaking to a specific avatar, have not been as affected as the advertisers who have, for lack of better words, hacked their way through audiences you know, in the platform to success. Um, it's less about audiences nowadays. And, and I would take it a step further to say that it's more than just about your ad creative as well. It's, it's even more about your specific message to a specific avatar so that you can run broad setups within your ad platform. Um, we call that message driven targeting. I like it. Tell us, tell us a little more about that. It's, it sounds like we used to really lean on Facebook or Meta's, you know, sort of algorithm, get us excellent targeting. We're going to drive results that way. That world is gone. And so now it's, we're leaning heavier on the creative. Just talk more about what you're doing and what you guys see working. Yeah, straight up. So like we run Facebook like it's TV. So as you know, when you're, when you see a TV ad, there's, unless you're doing like some pretty significant programmatic type stuff, like with mountain or something like that, you can still get into some targeting, but we, you know, if you've, if anybody who's listening and who will later watch the video, an example that I always use is, you know, you've watched ESPN, CNN, NBC, et cetera, and you see those ads for rheumatoid arthritis, right? So the first three to five seconds of the ad usually says something like this. Do you suffer from rheumatoid arthritis and inflammation, fatigue, et cetera, et cetera? And the list goes on, right? That is a broad setup within the ad platform, aka TV, right? You're watching CNN. Maybe it's a conservative audience and it's Fox. But at the end of the day, that message will only resonate to, this is an arbitrary stat, 20% of the audience, right? And so the message is driving the targeting. The problem with the, w the way that most people have run their Facebook ads for the last five or six years is they've relied on those rheumatoid arthritis interests in Facebook to find the buyer or the lead or whatever. And then the messaging has been super poor, right? So now when iOS hits and all of these sort of targeting signals are starting to go away, people are opting out of tracking. The targeting is worse, but... Is it really? I mean, if you you can still target that person, for lack of better words, an example again, with rheumatoid arthritis through Facebook, it's just that you have to be way better at marketing now and actually be great at marketing and a great marketer to have success on the platform. So it's weeded out, not even maybe the bottom 20%, but the bottom 40%, you know, of advertisers, right? The drop shippers are struggling, the startup brands who, you know, you know, we're just jumping in to try to capture this hot market of growing e-com from COVID are struggling. 
the the brands with cheap products, you know, under 50 bucks, under 75 bucks are struggling because the profitability isn't there because they don't have a long-term strategy and, and approach to how they're going about their acquisition, right? So it's like the advertisers who know how to market to a specific individual, craft a campaign towards a specific individual, craft a literal sales message towards a specific individual, and then develop an offer that is receptive to paid social traffic. Those are the ones that are still having success. Pretty fascinating. I like how you say that. It sounds like we're almost back to some kind of broad targeting, even though it's on social media, even though it's on mobile. And then we're using we're using the hook, we're using the messaging to do the targeting within who's seeing the initial impressions. Does Facebook or Meta then get smarter about who to show those ads to so that they can drive the CPM cost down? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the messaging and the creative is a huge element to reducing your CPM. Um, you know, usually you'll see high CPMs and TikTok, Facebook, doesn't matter. We'll charge higher CPMs when that creative and that messaging is just not resonating with the audience. Um, you'll probably see that more quickly in terms of like a feedback loop perspective on TikTok than you will on Facebook. Um, you know, Facebook is also sort of notorious for like certain niches and segments having higher CPMs as well. For example, health and wellness, sort of like that weight loss category versus fashion and apparel, for example. You know, typically fashion and apparel brands are going to have lower CPMs than health and wellness, weight loss, you know, style brands. Um, so yeah, hopefully that adds some context there. Yeah, pretty interesting. I know you have a lot of expertise, you know, with high spend accounts. I just, before we get into that, I just want to ask, how does a brand get there? If they're kind of stuck at lower spend, you know, how do you get up to something where you can start scaling like that? Is that a separate conversation? Is that someone else I should ask about that? Or, you know, how do you think about that piece? Yeah, so ironically, with our mastermind group earlier today, um, we do this exercise that we call the add or why formula, which is essentially like a, um, you know, math isn't everyone's always favorite sort of subject and thing to talk about, right? But but we do the math around the four key inputs to what generates ROI from paid traffic, which is CPM, click-through rate, conversion rate, and average order value. So um, so build, how do I get to 20,000 a day? So for example, or high spend, or how do I go from zero to 10,000 a day? Um, the root of all of it is a scalable offer. So number one, like, don't run paid traffic if your average order value is less than $75. Like, it's not going to be profitable. You're wasting your time. We can have tons of conversation around that as all the reasons why. The add or why formula will basically show most brands why that is not possible nowadays. There's always outliers, of course. Um, but with an, a historical average CPM right now of $15, and which is a benchmark, you know, WordStream, you know, released their report earlier this year that the average CPM is like $15, $14 and some change. You know, let's say you're getting a 1% click-through rate, a 2% conversion rate, which is Shopify average, and a $75 AOV. Your return on ad spend is one-to-one -one at a $75 AOV. That's an above average click-through rate. That's an industry average CPM, and that's an industry average conversion rate. So like, unless you are the diamond in the rough and the needle in the haystack and the ultimate cat's meow, you're not getting the three to three X return on ad spend without having as an extremely irresistible offer um, and a scalable offer. So um, the scalable offer is is the is the difference maker. Like, you can't get to twenty thousand dollars a day without a scalable offer. You can't get to five or ten thousand dollars a day without a scalable offer. And that offer needs to convert, you know, north of 2%. Um, typically, it needs to have a higher average order value, something like a bundle that breaks even that you're, you know, you're remarketing and your upsell flow, you know, whatever that could look like, whether you're in B2B lead gen, whether you're an info product or whether you're a physical product brand, sale number two and three is where you make your money. Um, so that's why an average order value of $75 is your best bet because it's going to give you the best chance to break even, if not maybe dr at a minimum, make a little bit of profit 
so that you can just dump all that money back into acquiring customers and then let your remarketing take over. Yeah, thank you for talking through the numbers there. I'm curious on a $75 AOV, is there a certain margin that you need to be working with as well? Yeah, I mean, so that's just like 100% margin, <laughs> right? So like if you're an info product you know, brand and you, your AOV is 75 and you're getting a $15 CPM with a 1% click-through rate and a 2% conversion rate, like that's break even on info product. So in reality, if your margin is 25%, you know, hard cost, cost of goods, 25%, you actually need to have an AOV of $100 to actually break even, not including management fees, investment into your marketing, creative and things like that. That's just to break even on your ad spend. Um, that's why the math is so important and most people don't think about it, right? Like they come back to guys like you and me and they're like, oh, my marketing's not working. It's like, yo, the offer was failed from the beginning. So it's like our responsibility to either say, hey, do not run this or B, this is what you need to run. And then they could either say, oh, well, so-and-so said that I can get a three X return. Good luck. You know, like go work with, go work with this person. Um, you know, that's promising you that. So, so yeah, like the numbers just break down so easily when you really look at it up front. Um, I think a lot of brands just in general, like they fall in love with their product, which I totally get it. Like I, I get why they do that. Um, a lot of, a lot of companies will invest heavily into inventory before they ever sort of forecast what their cost per acquisition will be. And then, you know, they've got tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars tied up in inventory. They jump from agency to agency to try to hit the KPI that they will never be able to hit. They blame the marketing team. They eventually maybe go out of business, right? Because in reality, the expectation or the target was set up to fail from the beginning, which was all just like precluded due to investing into product that may or may not have ever had a chance to sell in the first place. Gotcha. It sounds like paid media doesn't work for everybody anymore. And the offer really matters. The price point really matters. You need to have meat on the bone if you're going to grow through advertising. Yeah. Or the flip side is have capital, right? Like have capital to acquire those customers at break even or at a loss, which is that's that's the big boy game, right? Like that's the medium size to large business game where they're like, hey, I've got 500K, I've got a million in the bank to bankroll this acquisition. I'm good to lose 10 or 20 bucks on every customer that I acquire because that customer is valuable to me and I know that I will make 30 to 70% margin on sale number two, sale number three, sale number four. But unless the business model is set up for repeat purchase, the one-off, the one-off product brands, those are the ones that are struggling the most, especially at price points lower than a hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. You need to have front end and back end and it needs to all make sense. I'm, I, I want to, I want to know what you guys are doing, but before we transition to that, I just have to ask, you know, you, you talked us through these numbers. How do you guys vet and you say, you know what? If, unless we're hitting these criteria, we don't even work with you or don't even bother on your own. Is it, is it just those same numbers you said? Like, what is that process to vet clients? It's knowing what offers scale well profitably through paid traffic and at what price points. So number one, um, right out of the gate, like lead gen, still really good. You know, so like even if it's low ticket lead gen, you know, you're getting leads for five to 50 bucks, as long as that company has a back end to either bring them into a sales call or a sales process, those are still doing okay. You know, we work on, we work on lead gen into high ticket offers of, you know, like $2,500 and more, which is basically a call funnel. Um, those are crushing it, you know, three to 10 X, you know, return. Um, second one is going to be sort of subscription. So, you know, anything, especially if it's a, a high AOV subscription, like $100 plus, where um, they make a lot of money on second, third, like month two, month three, et cetera, those brands and those companies are making acquisition decisions based on the six month value of the customer, not the day one profit. Super important detail there, not day one profit. Um, the third one is one, um, sort of kind of like what I would call like one-off or one-time purchases of AOV greater than a hundred bucks. We just did that math together, you know, uh, 
on the video. So, you know, if you're if your AOV is 100 bucks and your conversion rate is 2% and your click through rate is 1%, like you're literally getting a one to one return on that spend. Um, guaranteed. Like you can't beat the math. Like you can't beat the spreadsheet. Sure. If you can get higher click through rate or better conversion rate, that could change it too, though. Absolutely. Like, and there's things that you can do to optimize your conversion rate and things, but it's not like that, that ROAS isn't going to go to 4X. You know what I mean? Like, you're still up against benchmarks and things like that, um, you know, at the end of the day. Um, and so, so high ticket AOV for one-off purchases of greater than $100 performing pretty well. And then anything less than 75 bucks, I don't even touch it. Um, you know, so $75 AOV and below, like no-go zone. Um, it's just painful for them and for us. Um, it usually, depending on the cash position of the company, you know, nine times out of 10, those businesses don't have that, you know, couple hundred K to a million, you know, unless they're already an established, you know, seven, eight figure brand. Um, so pretty much nowadays, we don't work with anybody who doesn't have a proven offer. Um, but, you know, so it's, it, we sort of position ourselves as optimization experts. I shouldn't say sort of, we do. Um, so we look at it as takeover. So like if you think of from an investment sort of mindset, you know, an investor who comes in and takes over a business where that business owner couldn't get it to, you know, to Y from X, that's, that's how we position ourselves is we come into that, you know, low seven figure, mid seven figure, eight figure brand, and we reduce their CAC and then scale it up. So the entire process that I teach and that I implement is based on a CPA reduction methodology in order to reduce cost to then scale and unlock new growth. Okay. It seems like that's what I should be asking you about. How do you, how do you do, you know, reduce that customer cost per acquisition? Yeah. Uh, very methodically. Um, so I'm a, I, it's probably not a surprise at this point. I'm, I'm a nerd when it comes to like the scientific and data side of, of marketing. Um, but I have a lot of experience in high ticket sales as well. But um, outside of that, the whole methodology is rooted on what we call ad variable isolation, which essentially means like simple terms, like dumb it down a little bit, you know, um, a CRO based approach to, how to run ad creative tests. So we isolate variables through messaging in order to like literally find what type of messaging, what hooks are driving purchases, what headlines are driving purchases, what headlines on creatives are driving purchases, and then split testing those through a process that we call scroll frame optimization. So we go super deep into optimizing winning ad concepts so that we simply get more juice from the orange so that we create less fluctuation within the day-to-day -day system, which is how I'm able to spend $25,000, $30,000 a day at pretty consistent performance. Like, it is not easy to maintain a 1.5x ROAS at $25,000, 30k a day, unless you know how to not disrupt the system. Um, and it's all rooted on this philosophy of, philosophy of which that I call um, sticking to the winning ad formula, which basically means... When you're running ads, don't add a bunch of random shit together all at one time and not understand why what's not working. You're changing one thing at a time and really figuring out what difference did it make. Strategically. Yeah, strategically. Yeah. I think what I'm hearing and what you're saying there too is you may have an ad variable and you're A-B testing that, but even beyond that, you kind of have the concept of the ad itself, whatever that text is whatever that video or headline is, whatever the call to action is, there's, there's kind of a broader thing. So if you were to duplicate that ad, you might, you might even have different creative, but you've got the same concept. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So like, let's say, for example, um, let's just make something up together. Like lose seven pounds in seven days with Will Perry's um, super uh, fat weight loss system, right? So like that is the promise of the campaign. The, the problem with the way that most people run ads is they, they change the messaging all the time, right? When like that is that promise is the reason that people buy, right? So what we do is, is we split test into that messaging so that we can replicate it to reach different segments of the audience so that we can 
you know, reach different pain points, emotional triggers, etc. Um, and that's the process of optimizing through the winning ad formula versus essentially changing the core dynamics of what makes your ad and your ad campaign, you know, convert. Um, and so it's, it's really about understanding fundamentally, like not just like what line of ad copy is working, but one layer deeper of, well, is it a promise hook? Is it a proclamation hook? Is it a benefit solution hook? Is it a benefit solution headline? Is it an offer driven headline? And then one layer deeper within an offer driven headline, is it an X result in Y time offer driven headline with a benefit? So like that's how deep we're going to the levels of understanding. Whereas most people are just like, here's some copy, here's some images. Hey, Facebook, here's an audience, like get me a three X return. Um, but when you drill down into the mastery levels of understanding around true messaging and like the actual intent that that drives into the conversion, that's how we're able to maintain performance because we know psychologically and emotionally like why people are buying and we're drilling down into that much, much deeper sort of in a week by week cadence. Fascinating. It sounds like we're really going deep on the direct response marketing fundamentals and we understand how those apply. It's, it's, we're writing the copy that way. Does this also then, I assume, figure into you know the UGC ad creative you're doing, what people are saying in the video, what the image of the, of the ad is? Absolutely. So like, think of UGC as like a mask for these direct response principles and concepts that you're referring to, right? So like, if I see two ads in my feed, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, whatever. Um, the minute that I see branded content as a user, like most people are turned off, right? So the actual, the first impression, the first thing that we're selling is attention, right? So we have to get through that filter of, is this an ad? Is this not an ad? That's the first thing that we're actually selling as advertisers when we're displaying our content, right? So we overcome that hurdle of not having branded content. Now they see what we call native UGC creative, right? Which is like a video of you and me talking and someone's like, oh, this looks like my friend Egan and my friend Will, like they must have done a podcast together. But then three minutes in, we're like, hey, if you thought any of this was uh, helpful to you, go to www.helpme.com, right? And so like then the offer shows up and we engaged them through the content first, then we converted them, you know, through our engaging script, which is a direct response script. Um, so when we're casting creators and we're developing scripts for UGC content, we're doing it through a creation lens of TikTok. Like we're creating TikToks, like dance moves, fast editing styles, trending music, um, those sort of things. Like the weird robot voices and stuff like that. But like the messaging is, the root of the messaging is still the same. You know, so think, put a little robot voice on me like right now and it says, this is the best juice cleanse that I've ever tried, right? Like that is a direct response. This, these, those like entry point, but it's told through a lens of like native UGC content. That's brilliant. It's always so interesting with direct response of, you know, the classics, the books you go back and read that are canon are talking about ads that are 100 years old, but they're saying sort of some of the same things that you're telling us now is if you're running an ad in a magazine, don't make it look like an ad, make it look like an article. And even here we are now with AI and TikTok and everything, and you're saying it still applies. It's a weird little video. It looks like high schoolers would be in or something, but it's like we're that that messaging, like the the line is still there. So I'm I'm utterly fascinated by that. Is there something you can show us, Will, to give us an example? Yeah, let's um let me pull up a slide for you guys real quick that I was actually going through with some of my mastermind group earlier. Okay, cool. It's working. So this is this is kind of like multiple of those concepts tied into one. This is what we call scroll frame optimization. Um, this is pulled from our winning ad formula SOP guide. Um, so essentially, you have this ad, right? So there's there's five positions of real estate. You've got the hook, which is the first line of ad copy. You've got so we call this the scroll frame, right? So like when you're scrolling through Facebook, when you're scrolling through TikTok. 
this is what you see. This is the piece of real estate that you see. And so the first line is the hook. The, the, the bulk of this entire piece of real estate is the actual image of the video. So that takes up about 80% of that scroll frame. Then you've got the headline on the creative. That's number three. Then you've got the headline uh, in the uh, actual ad itself, Facebook or TikTok. Then you've got the call to action button. So you've really got five pieces of real estate upon the first impression, aka the scroll frame, that I see within the first one to three seconds that I can optimize for, right? And so cheat code, super cheat code. If you guys focus more on optimizing your thumbnails to your videos, you will be amazed at how much longer your ads will run. Um, Because if you don't change the core of what makes that ad convert and you just change the front end and focus on getting attention through hooks, text overlays, thumbnails, etc., the, that ad that you spent 20 grand on to develop with that creative agency based out of LA, you can get that ad to run a hell of a lot longer by optimizing the scroll frame of that content. And so essentially what you do is, is you pick these individual pieces to run a structured approach, which we call our four phase SVST testing system, where we're literally testing 10 different hooks you know, on this creative in a phase one message testing campaign. Then when we identify the new winning hook that beat the control, we're then moving that into a phase two creative test and we're relaunching our creative test. We're killing it based on kill points, like one and a half times target CPA, for example. If it passes the test, it continues to run. If it fails the test, we move on to the next one. So we, we literally will individually optimize each of these elements very strategically and, and intentionally um, in order to continue to reduce that cost per acquisition. And once we crack it, we scale it. Um, so, I mean, I've got ads that spend, individual ads that spend anywhere from 500 to several thousands of dollars a day on one actual ad within Facebook specifically. So this is just one example. It's one that I had pulled up from a a slide earlier. Um, So like, let's say that this was a winning ad, right? Like if we look at the numbers on the side, it's getting a 2x return, not bad, pretty solid. Um, So like, how do I keep this going, right? Like how do I, what do I do next? Well, I actually optimize through this creative um, because there's hundreds of versions of this winning ad that we could create through proven elements. And so if I focus on different UGC stills of the image, if I um, isolate the headlines and test it with promise headlines and benefit solution headlines on the creative and and in the actual ad setup, and then if I um, also pull out the avatar and test different avatars within the creative as well so that it speaks to a different segment of that broad audience. There's so many variations of a winning ad concept, but unless you isolate your variables this way, there's no way that you can test like this. There's no way that you can scale to $20,000 a day without understanding the messaging um, by optimizing through your creative versus just developing and creating more creative. Um, hopefully that's not like way over everybody's head. Uh, you know, so this is just a really good example. Um, let me actually show you guys one more thing. Um, This would be, for example, a what we call a phase one test. Um, Okay, cool, that's pulling up. So a phase one test would be, I know this is like really small. This is a Facebook uh, creative example where the physical headline, so the the headline meaning like the the line of copy in the gray box below the image or video. Um, All of these creatives, so it's one ad set, 10 ads within the ad set, a traffic campaign, and what you're testing for is the style of messaging that is actually resonating better with your proven audience. So, for example, these top four passed the initial test through unique CTR. So, for e-com, we're looking for unique CTRs of greater than 5% with a traffic campaign. Um, For lead gen, it's not uncommon to see stuff way higher than that. Um, so in this scenario, once you start running these ads for conversion, those CTRs are going to come down pretty significantly, you know, so we try to operate on the rule of thirds here. So if this is getting a 5% cost, 
click-through rate for traffic in a phase one testing campaign, we know that the messaging is resonating with the audience. When we then move that to a phase two conversion creative testing campaign, that click-through rate arguably should be somewhere in the neighborhood of one and a half to two and a half percent because we know that it's going to drop. But if we can constantly beat the control methodically and strategically, that's how we reduce cost per lead or cost per acquisition, ACOS, it's basically all the same, right? Um, so this, this testing methodology is put into place to constantly beat the controls so that you can bring your cost down. But it's all driven through messaging. Wow, fascinating. Thank you for showing that. I, not, not dependent, yeah. yeah, I was just gonna add not dependent upon audiences at all in Facebook, which is what most people think. Mm -hmm. the, the targeting could be broad as can be potentially. Yep, exactly. Thank you for showing that. I was going to ask, what are the, you know, how do you measure whether a test is successful? What are the variables you're looking at? It sounds like the metrics depend on what part of the test we're doing. I heard you say, are we getting CPA lower for that first one? But then I also heard you say, we'll do a traffic campaign and we'll, com we'll compare a click-through rate. Are there any other metrics you look at? And how, how do you think about that table of we're testing this part? Here's the number that's going to tell us whether we win or not. Yeah, so every, the only thing we care about is target CPA. So everything is built on... Um, uh, sort of KPI based on target CPA. Uh, there's the KPIs and things for phase one traffic testing campaigns, but that only makes up a small majority. Like the the real target is target CPA. We don't run ad accounts and campaigns based on ROAS because ROAS is a fluctuating metric based on user behavior. So what we do is we control accounts based on cost, um, based on what we call closed loop funnels, which are you know, essentially one ad, one product, one landing page, closed loop experience. Um, you know, not this broad catalog style that could create fluctuating, you know, purchase value, um, which creates fluctuating return. And so, um, so everything is built on target CPA. So like if your target CPA is 50, just to use easy numbers, when you're running creative tests, you want to spend when you're get, just getting going, you want to spend more um, conservatively and test up to one and a half times CPA to get your first purchase. And you want to test in your daily ad set budget at your target CPA so that you can get at least one conversion per day. So many people who have like a, a cost per acquisition average of $50 who test at $10, $20, $25. It takes them three days, five days to get a purchase, right? And they're like, oh, it's not working. Well, actually what's not working is your mindset towards budget allocation and just being fearful of actually spending. Um, so unless you know how to do it, right? So if you're testing based on target CPA and your daily budget at your ad set, TikTok, Facebook, doesn't matter. We run it the same way. You're getting at least on average that one conversion per day. Um, if you let that whole test run for 10 days, you've now reached your point of statistical significance of getting a winning ad, then you scale it. Um, if you condense that time frame, you can double your daily budget and get the data in five days, and then you scale it after five days instead of 10. Um, but the initial kill point is the most important part. So you don't want to overspend on tests that don't drive conversions. You also don't want to over overspend on tests that don't drive conversions at your target cost. Um, so you're constantly operating off of this kill point, which reduces waste. Um, and you're giving yourself a methodical approach in order to find winning ads that you can later scale. And the kill point could be CPA above $50 or whatever that is. Exactly. It's that's the part that's relative per individual business, you know? So like if it's, if it's low ticket lead gen, you know, like $10 leads, for example, you're going to run those tests more aggressively at say three to five times CPA. So as long as I have one lead by times by by time I spend 30 bucks, I've passed my early kill point. I'm going to let that run for three more days, which means I'm going to spend 90 more dollars. As long as my cost per acquisition is continuing to come down, essentially the learning is working in my favor. You know, Facebook, TikTok doesn't matter. Then I'm trending in the right direction. Um, so I could obviously speak way more on all of that as well, but that's probably a good spot, uh, spot to pause. All right. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for sharing this. Um, where's a good, you know, who, who's, a, who's a good person to reach out to and where can they find you? And feel free to talk about the different brands you have. 
Yeah, so I mean, if anything that I've chatted about today and shared with you guys um, is are things that you want to learn, um, just go to www.elitemediabuyersacademy.com. You can get a $97 masterclass where I literally open my entire playbook from more than 65 million in ads. Um, that's what that's everything that we've talked about is is in the training. Um, we also have a mastermind. So if you want to stay, you could stick around for the mastermind. That's probably the best place. Like instead you could find me on LinkedIn and stuff and on social media, but in terms of giving you guys real value that will help you reduce cost per acquisition, just go check out creative testing masterclass. Um, the group is spending more than 5 million a month and they're all implementing the same process together. Um, so we'd love to help anyone who, who uh, is looking to reduce their costs so they can s scale it up. All right. Love it. I hope to have you back on. And thank you, Will Perry, for sharing what's working in e-commerce. Absolutely. Thank you for having me.